Bowling with the theft. I encourage you to get theft. What? All things the game of bowling. Helping bowlers. The hand collapses down. And I'm going to try to bowl the best I can. 1,000 subscribers. And I want to challenge Dan Nelson. Tom Corbin. Jason Belmont. Hey everyone, good Wednesday evening. Welcome to another episode of Bowling with the Feth, a platform for you to share your unique bowling story live on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much for uh, staying up a little later with us tonight. We had to adjust the times to, uh, you know, work out uh, some schedules and make everything align, but I'm glad we did because we've got a terrific guest tonight. Nico's in the house. Nico, thank you uh, for uh, your comments supporting uh, the show in this episode, always appreciated. And, uh, you know, looking forward to uh, the conversation, just as I'm sure you are. Jay Santos in as well. Hey, Faf, the World Series of Bowling has been great. It has been. Um, really glad to uh, see all that live bowling on TV. And uh, we can kind of get caught up on where we are right now. If you're live like those two, uh, feel free to chime in on that live chat. It's available. And if you're watching this on replay, leave a comment. I see them all. I try to respond to all of them as soon as I can. And uh, always appreciate uh, you interacting with me in this venture. Well, let's get caught up on the World Series of Bowling, shall we? Uh, finals of the Shark Championship just ended. EJ Tackett hitting a clutch strike on the first shot in the 10th frame of the championship match, defeated Shota Koazawi 228-213 for his 22nd PBA title and first this season. Earlier in the week, you had Chris Prather and Andrew Anderson defeating Bill O'Neill and Jason Belmonte to claim their second Roth Holman doubles title. Anderson hit a 10th frame strike to seal the deal there. Dio Bernard went from first-timer on television to first-time champion in a matter of about 90 minutes. He defeated Alec Keplinger, Mikey Schlebach, and Marshall Kent to win the Cheetah Championship. And then it was four lefties and Belmo in the Scorpion Championship Finals. Matt Russo defeated Packy Hanrahan to take his second tour title. The World Championship match play starts tomorrow. That is on Bowl TV. Then you got two televised shows for the World Championship Saturday and Sunday. The play-in round, 6 p.m. Wisconsin time, Saturday on FS1, and then the finals, 11 a.m. Wisconsin time on Sunday on Big Fox. Looking forward to seeing all of that. USBC Senior Queens in Las Vegas, Nevada. Kathy Ledford of Boise, Idaho, defeating defending champion Dana Osek twice to take that title. She squeaked by 213-206 to 206 for the first win. Then put up 247 in the second game to win the $8,000 first prize going away. The ladies bowled a total of 15 games of qualifying and the top 31. And Osek, who was the defending champion, advanced to a double elimination match play bracket to determine the stepladder finalists. And Ledford came out on top in that stepladder. Linda Barnes mentioned to me at the Masters that she'd be bowling the 2024 International Golden Ladies Classic. And then she goes and wins the whole darn thing, uh, the senior division anyway. Uh, the, that championship was held on Friday. Uh, Barnes was the top seed in the stepladder, defeated Osek 202 to 201 at the Orleans in Vegas. $2,500 went to the USBC Hall of Famer. And you've got Barbara DeMorris winning the super senior division and $1,000 there. She defeated Karen Barkal. 222-216 in that championship match of that stepladder. DeMorist is the mother of episode 66 guest Jeff DeMorist, so it's no wonder those results are on tournamentbowl.com. If you watch that episode, you'll know that he is the brains behind tournamentbowl.com. Uh, Billy M saying, hey oh, hey, thanks for joining us. And Jay saying, EJ, representing the one-handers, he loves that. Uh, Linda Barnes, a class act. Congratulations to her. And uh, yeah, a great win for her. She's uh, basically said she's kind of dipping her toe back in to competitive bowling. But wow, she's doing it well, isn't she? And now a word from our sponsor. Mm. Raise your snack standards. 
Oh, baby, that stuff is good. Chip Magnet Salsa, sponsoring Bowling with the Fef. Based in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and distributing to stores in more than 38 states and Canada. And have we got a deal for those of you who watch this show on a regular basis. If you uh, purchase $30 or more from ChipMagnetSalsa.com, put in this promo code at checkout, BWTF2024. You'll get 25% off your purchase, and there is no limit on that. So feel free to stock up. Chip Magnet, raise your snack standards. A big thank you to Chip Magnet uh, for supporting bowling and bowling with the FEF. Well, we have a terrific guest tonight. Um, our guest secured the first major of her PWBA career at the 2023 U.S. Women's Open and is hoping to build on that starting up again next month. The PWBA Go Bowling Twin Cities Open is coming up May 2nd through May 4th at Cedar Vale Lanes. It will be the first national tour stop in Minnesota since 2022. Uh, Brianna Cote is heading out on the tour. She will be in that main field in Egan uh, next month to start out the tour season. And uh, she is here joining us live uh, from Arizona. <laughs> and Brianna, thank you so much for the time. Welcome to Bowling my, my pleasure. Good evening. <laughs> yeah, you had kind of warned me at the beginning to you know, that there may be some excess background noise <laughs> because Mr. Cote is also streaming tonight. Tell us yeah. <laughs> yeah, he decided to, um, you know, just stream. He likes to play video games, you know, with his friends. And he was like, I think I'm going to start streaming. I'm like, okay, whatever, go for it, have fun. And so he's kind of doing it. So if you hear some screaming in the background, hopefully that probably means that his game, he is not going very well. But, oh, okay. um, or dogs barking because he's playing with them. So, um, but yeah, that don't mind it. Nothing to be alarmed. It's just, sure. you know, my yeah. husband and his dog having fun. So. We, we are a household of two cats, so I totally understand, you know, pet interruptions. It happens. It does. The show yeah. goes on, though. It's all, it it's all good. Yeah. Um, you told me before that you watched the Shark Championship tonight. Mm -hmm. So I figured this was a perfect opportunity to kind of tackle a couple of the questions that Randy Peterson posed during that first match. Um, he was talking about two-handed bowling because, of course, in the Scorpion Championship, you had all two handers. And he wanted to know, will two-handed bowling uh, make bowling with a thumb obsolete and when will two-handed bowling make a real impact on the PWBA tour? I'm wondering about your thoughts on both of those. Yeah, I think they're both valid questions. And, you know, like I'd, I'd heard him say in the telecast, he really just wanted a, a discussion for it. You know, it's not like it's, you know, should it or shouldn't happen. Like it's like a, a right way or a wrong way um, to each their own how they bowl, you know. But I think that um, P you will see more and more bowlers, especially on the men's side and the men's tour, be two-handed and not use their thumb. I Will it be obsolete? I don't think so. Not in my lifetime, I don't think. Um, you know, maybe in, in a lot of years to come. But um, it's definitely more popular. I've been to the last couple of junior golds, and I always do clinics over there um, with Storm, and we definitely see a lot more and more two-handed bowlers. So, I mean, the youth are definitely – picking it up and they're picking it up quickly and they are just becoming masters of it. You know, they want to be like Belmo. They want to be like, you know, let's have like Jesper or even Russo or Simo. All these great players are looking to you and they have so many tools to figure out how to be so good. They have technology that, you know, I didn't have. I couldn't go on YouTube to see how bowling. I had to, you know, watch it um, on, on TV or see it in person. But you know, obsolete. I, I don't think so. I think you're still going to have some old school that just use your thumb and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so I, it, I don't think it'll be obsolete, but I do feel like on the men's tour, you will see more of the two handed style um, in the future. I, I couldn't tell you when a time frame that will be, but it's going to happen. And we've seen that throughout the years. Um, and last night's show definitely proved that. Um, you know, with, with Belmo, the, you know, the OG, as they called him on TV, being the one doing it. So um, that's kind of where I feel about the PBA tour. As far as the women's tour, um, I know there are some really good two-handed women who are in college bowling right now that will make their way into our tour in the next year or two. 
Um, so it's going to, I think it's going to be a little bit of a slower pace into the women's tour, um, you know, to kind of learn how, what kind of strength you need as far as upper body and lower body strength. Um, you were just built a little differently. So I think it's going to take us as just a little bit different to adapt to it, but I think it will get there. It just may work not quite there as quickly as the men's side. Um, uh, but again, like junior gold, there was a huge variety of, of, girls and boys bowling with the two-handed style. So it's going to make a big impact and it's going to be uh, more present than not uh, in the very near future on both sides for sure. Yeah. I'm glad you said that about it not uh, becoming obsolete as far as the, the, the thumb in style, because I, I feel enough like a dinosaur, you know, watching these guys <laughs> pull what since yes. I can't do that two-handed thing. I'd love to be able to, to do it. And that's why <laughs> It impresses me. I, I mean, it is. you know, it's you hard. Start, it's yeah. hard. It's it's a, it's a craft. It really is. You know, like you've heard. You know, you know, Bomo say he's really tried to fine tune that craft. It is a craft. Um, you know, to to bowl in that style, it's hard to do. I I can't do it. Um, I've tried. It just doesn't work out. But um, just with any of our styles, it's our own craft um, in our own little way, and it it takes time to to perfect. And you know, sometimes it takes someone. A little bit of time to to figure it out and sometimes take a little bit longer to figure out so but i, I do feel like the thumb is is not going to be obsolete i think people are still going to be taught to to bowl with their thumb yeah <laughs> at the old school way and that keeps us relevant which is good <laughs> <laughs> um jay says that uh, do you both always wear your bowling jerseys around your house <laughs> no i i don't i i mean you know Bree, you're kind of in the business, uh, you know, yeah. so a, a different perspective. I'm guessing you don't. We don't, no. Uh, you know, my husband uh, doesn't really have bowling jerseys because he doesn't really bowl much anymore. He just bowls league. So he just makes himself clothes and, and stuff. But no, I, you know, I wear, I have a jersey that I have to wear on my Tuesday night league because it's required that we all have matching jerseys. Um, but otherwise, I just wear when I'm bowling and stuff, I just had a jacket on because it was a little chillier in the house today. <laughs> so um, the AC had to kick on. So it's okay. getting a little warm outside. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm in a similar situation. You know, team captain buys the the jerseys for the team. You wear them in league. And uh, but no, I mean, I'm sure Mrs. Pfeff wouldn't want you to know what I'm wearing around this house most of the time, Jay. <laughs> Uh, Hosan uh, says, hello, Bree. Oh, hello, well, Hosan. it is fun. I have you, both you and Randy on different screens. <laughs> wow. He's watching both. Yes, yeah, Hosan. He is our PWBA super fan. So, um, hi, Hosan. We miss you. Um, hopefully we get to see you guys soon. But yeah, he's, um, he's a, he's a great fan, great guy. And, uh, he spends a whole summer with us. Uh, it was great to see him. Yeah, for sure. Um, tell me how excited you are that the tour is so close to starting up here. I'm very excited. You know, it's it's one of those things where when tour ends, it's like, man, that that went by so fast. And now what am I what am I gonna do? I have to go back to like a routine and oh man, tour is like so far away. And now here we are two weeks out and tour is right around the corner. Um, so I'm just super excited to get back on the lanes. I love competing. Um, I love competing out there with all the other ladies and just having a good time and um, spending time with my roommates. And we just, we all get along. We have just a great time. Um, whether bowling goes well or bowling doesn't go well. Um, it's a good environment to be in. And so I, just, but I really just want to compete. I'm ready to kind of get my feet in there again. And you know, I do get to compete here at home a lot um, still, which is great, but it's just not the same as being on tour, you know, like weekend, week out, different patterns and, you know, the grind of it. It's, um, it's exhausting, but I absolutely love it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, how, what did these next couple weeks look like for you? I mean, as far as preparing for this kind of thing, because, you know, normally you're preparing for one event, but this is kind of the first of many. Yeah, I'm actually very fortunate right this year. Um, you know, this week, it's my last full week here at home. Um, I do have an, a, a small event that I get to bowl this Saturday here at home, and they're putting out um, a U.S. Open pattern for the tournament. So I'm like, well, great prep. And then um, next week, I actually head off to Team USA camp. So I will be there all week, which is 
um, I'm really grateful that we have it right before tour because we get to kind of fine tune things. We get to work on, on, you know, really just narrowing down some things. We'll, you know, be together as a team, you know, then, you know, the following week we're going to be competing against each other, but it's such really good training to kind of see where we are maybe right before tour and before some team USA events that happen, you know, pretty much right after the tour is over. Um, so it's, I'm really excited that I have, you know, that coming up and I have access to those coaches um, as well as my teammates to prepare myself as best as I can mentally and physically for the weeks to come on tour. Yeah. Timing couldn't be better with uh, all that stuff coming up. Um, you know, I mentioned that uh, the last, uh, you know, tour event in Minnesota was in 2022. Um, I happened to have some video from there because I was I was there on site as uh, that was going on, if it would actually pull up. There we go. Um, so you know, tell, <laughs> tell me what you know about Cedar Vale, what you've learned about it. I mean, you know, this is a house you've bowled in several times, and you did make the final five in 22. I do, yeah. I've actually made the show here twice. Um, I like this place. <laughs> um, you know, we were there in 2022, and uh, it, it's a great host, great facility, great people. Um, they treat us very well, and, you know, it's it's just a, it's a bowling community, you know, where we are in Minnesota. So um, I'm really looking forward to going back and seeing, you know, how it's been. And, you know, the lanes have treated me well in the past. And I'm hoping that they treat me well in the past like they did. So um, the last time we bowled, I think we bowled on a little bit of a longer pattern. Um, I can tell you I was throwing a hyper self used. Um, <laughs> I threw that ball pretty much the entire time. Um, but, yeah, it, it's, it's great that we get to go back there and kick off the season there. Um, like I said, Ian, it's just a great host. We've been there a few times. You know, the crowds are always great. The programs are really good. Uh, we've had live shows there. We've also had full TV shows there. So, um, you know, it's just really exciting. That's where we get to kick off this this 2024 season to somebody that someplace that's kind of been home, I would say, yeah. um, since the relaunch of the tour. For sure. And, uh, you know, you, you mentioned first stop of the tour. We have kind of a new element this time, right? You've got a PTQ in this. And, of course, yeah. you'll be in the main field with all your, your past success. But how does that kind of change the landscape, maybe for the, the women that you're competing against, as far as having that extra step for some of them? to get mm -hmm. into the final game. Yeah, definitely. I mean, having a PTQ, um, it's different, but it's also – um, kind of a, a good problem to have. That means we have a lot of interest. That means our events are selling out, that women's bowling is growing. And, you know, that's that's our goal is we want women's bowling to be big and we want to have all these people join the PWB tour and give out all these titles. So, but yeah, it it is going to be, I think, different for maybe some of those individuals who maybe came out of college and instead of getting right into the main field, like those maybe in the years past, now they have this extra step they have to go through which is a PTQ of eight games. I think it's eight games. Um, you know, it's, it's a sprint to, to get into that main field. And then you got the main field of qualifying and then all these other things. So, you know, if, if, if my mindset had to do these PTQs, you basically have to take it as a separate event. Um, it's its own tournament. It's its own thing. You can't think ahead of trying to get into that main field. What's that main field going to be like? What's that qualifying going to be like? You really have to think about staying present with that PTQ, you know, taking it one shot at a time and get yourself into those few spots that do make it into the into the main field. It's, it's no, you know, I think the men have PTQs too. So, I mean, you have to, you really just have to think of it as it's, they're not, really this the same events two separate things and you just have you know stages to get there um so i think it'll be very interesting to see how how the up-and-comers handle that with this extra step to get into the main field yeah for sure um we've got kind of a, a pair of questions here from okay. esj83 wants to know what are some of the perks of bowling on team usa and how long do you want to continue to bowl on the team yeah, those are good questions. Um, you know, the biggest perk that for Bowling Team USA is I get to represent my country. I get to compete internationally and represent, you know, somebody other than myself, um, my teammates, my country, my coaches. Um, it's one of the best feelings in the world to do that. 
uh, to hear your national anthem being played. Um, it's it's priceless. It really is. Um, you know, a, a huge perk is I have amazing coaches. I have amazing teammates um, that turn into amazing friends and close friends. So um, it's a family. Uh, so that's the perks of it. Um, and I will continue to do it as long as I am physically able to do it. <laughs> so, um, you know, nothing is kind of given me any lights to, um, not continue. It's, it's been a big part of my bowling career, big, uh, goal of mine in my bowling career to compete for my country. And, um, as long as I still have the passion to do it and I feel like I can represent my country well and make them proud, I, I will do it. If I think I ever reach a point where it's time for me to hang them up as far as Team USA and maybe the next generation needs to move in, um, only time will tell. Sure. Years and years and years. Yeah, I mean, but I'm also no spring chicken because I am the second oldest on the team and I'm an older player on tour as well. So... <laughs> Each 21 game. plus you're all 21, 21 plus, plus. yellow yeah, asterisk <laughs> <laughs> no that's great to hear though um a, a few weeks ago we crossed paths at uh, the open championships in las vegas um i of course kind of stunk it up through through the course of the the three events but i caught you on uh, on, on team day uh you, oh, said that, you said that you weren't doing so hot at, no. at that point but uh, tell us about how you kind of made out a after the thing was said and done. Yeah, you know, Open Championships, um, it's it's hard. Uh, I'm not going to lie. It's one of the harder events that I do participate in. Team event was hard this year. They hooked a lot. Um, I don't think I was um, on top of the moves as quickly. I think as a team, we could have done some things to um, – maybe break down the lanes a little bit better to make them a little easier on ourselves for a team event. Um, but doubles and singles was much nicer. I was able to bowl so much better for doubles and singles. Um, I bowled one squad of the bowler's journal. Um, so yeah, I, but it's with anything, you know, you get one shot at it and it is what it is, you know, like, yeah, I wish I could say I bowl great all the time, but that's not true. Sometimes I'm not going to bowl good. Um, and then I just looked at, all right, team event wasn't great. Uh, not, a, not a good day. Let's hopefully the next day is better. And it was so. Uh, but I had a good time with the people that I bowled with. And um, I also got to to watch the Masters during my downtime and uh, cheer on some friends from home. So it was it was still a great trip. Yeah. Um, because of that, I, I figured, you know, that was kind of a good opportunity uh, to ask somebody we both know, uh, Theo Dothe. Do they? <laughs> Yeah, about, uh, about being your teammate. And uh, <laughs> he, he, he told me that being a teammate with you is great. Having someone with experience and knowledge that you have, how can you not want that on your team? Aww. And uh, he says he can't count the number of times that he's been lost game one. You help him with one or two minor changes and boom, he starts scoring. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tell me about kind of your, your mindset and, and your role on a team like that. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, like I, they're my teammates and even our companion team, and we had four teams there. I mean, if any of them needed help I'm, and they want to ask me my opinion, I'm, I'll am i give it to them. And if there are my teammates and they don't want my opinion and things aren't going well, I'm probably going to say something to them. But, um, you know, I've bowled with Theo for a long time um, through youth bowling up until now, and Theo is left-handed. So uh, I can see the left side of the lane too, which is um, it benefits him. And sometimes if I'm bowling against him, which is not very often now because he's more like a tournament director, which I'm grateful for. Um, I don't help him now if I have to bowl against him, but I'll help him <laughs> if he bowls with me. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I have no issues helping anyone. Um, same thing kind of happened last night at league. I was bowling um, league and this younger kid uh, came up to me and he goes, Hey, do, do you mind helping me? And I was like, no, not at all. I mean, how, how can I help if I can help somebody else get better? That's, you know, something that I can offer to the younger generation or my friends or just, you know, I, I have all this knowledge. I might as well share it. I'm not, you know, just bettering the sport and bettering them at the same time. Yeah. You, uh, you mentioned the, the masters. Uh, I was there too. Um, tell me who you were cheering for out there. Was it Cortez? Yeah, it was Cortez. Yeah. Tezzy. Um, you know, he's a great kid. He's watching him 
he's 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 a kid he's a freaking baby um <laughs> he's, but you know watching him bowl and you know last year was his first like full year on tour you know he's had a lot of personal things happen in his life but to see things start to come together and to see him um put the pieces together and it really start to pay off is it's just huge you know and he's been practicing so hard um, and really trying to figure out how it is to bowl on tour because bowling on tour versus bowling at home in league or local tournaments, they're completely different. They, they, they don't even mix. So you really have to learn to bowl on tour. And I had a conversation with him kind of towards the end of last year saying, you know, you really need to, to sit down maybe with your tour reps because their environment is so much different than us and just say, hey, like, what do you see? What am I not seeing? You know, how do I bowl out here versus when I'm at home? Like the equipment is different. It's just just a very different atmosphere. So to really see him have that success and and bowl so well, I mean, it was just really exciting to see because, like I said, he's he's not only a great bowler, he's he's a fantastic kid and he's a fantastic young man, but he's a kid to me. Um, and I do get to bowl with him a lot, to bowl against him a lot. I've bowled with him a lot. So I just I really enjoy him as a person and. Um, seeing his success is just just made me proud, you know, just glad to see that. Yeah, the reigning PBA Rookie of the Year, and he's got a terrific mm-hmm. physical game. If you He does. He really does, and he's worked really hard on it. Yeah. Um, Hosan says, don't worry. Uh, Shannon P. is still here. Yes, it, and if Shannon P. retires, then I am the oldest. <laughs> 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 but I have known Shannon since I was like 10, 11. 12 i we grew up together since she is originally from phoenix um so um i've shannon's been like my big sisters my whole life so um you know when she retires it oh i'll have to take on the oldest but i kept like you're still here shan she's like yep i'm perfect (laughs) yeah for sure and uh bsj83 wants to know which bowlers did you look up to growing up yeah, so my um, my idol growing up was Kim Terrell Kearney. Um, Kim Kearney, some people just know her as Kim Kearney now. But um, I I just admired, you know, her, the way she held herself together when she bowled, her poise, her physical game. Um, and she's just a great person. And as I got older in my bowling career, she was my junior Team USA coach, and now she's my Team USA coach. And and now she like, it's just crazy to see it come for a full circle because she'll text me and, you know, like our, our relationship is more like a personal as opposed to her being my idol. But um, she's just a great person. And she's the one that I really uh, just admired so much as far as, as the bowling um, on the ladies tour, you know, pre the relaunch. So, and I bowled a pro-am with her um, and it, she just, like she just stuck in my mind and she just changed my perception. I just like, I want to be that when I grow up, you know? And so I aspired to be someone like that. And then unfortunately there was a hiatus, but you know, I still made the most of it and thankfully it came back. And, um, but because of that, it still gave me that passion, that drive that when it did relaunch that I was going to do it. No questions asked. Yeah. You always hear that cliche. You never want to meet your heroes. So to meet one of your heroes Mm -hmm. and have her be, a great person. I mean, how cool is that? Oh, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's, you know, cause we, we, not everybody does, you know, get to meet their hero there. It, sometimes it's their paths don't cross. Sometimes it's too hard. Maybe they're too famous. Sometimes they pass away before you get the opportunity. Um, but to be able to have her like in my circle um, as someone I looked up to as a kid. And now that I, as an adult, I, can still look up to and still contact if I need help. It's, um, it's surreal at times. Um, if her name ever shows up on my phone. (laughs) (laughs) So let's get into your bowling story. I got to start out with, you know, the basics. Are you originally from Arizona? I am. I am born and raised in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, yeah, there's not many of us out here in the West. Um, you know, as far as like the women's tour and all, Cortez now is also on the men's tour and, you know, I have Jacob also um, from the Phoenix area, but yeah, I am born and raised here in Tucson. Um, I love it here. Uh, Minus my time in Missouri for school, but um, yeah, I am originally from here and I intend on staying. (laughs) 
So tell me about the that time when you first got into bowling. I feel mm-hmm. like we've all kind of got a story about that. Yeah. What led you uh, to our great sport? Yeah, so what led me into this sport was my grandfather. Um, he had brought me a bowling ball from back then. It was the APC Championships from Reno, and it was a red Mickey Mouse ball. I remember it so, so vividly, um, and I had a matching bag, and – um, he brought it home for me and took me practicing. Um, he bowled and I just fell in love with it. It taught me the basics of how to bowl. And um, I'm an only child. So when my parents and my grandparents would bowl league on Tuesdays, I would go get my own lane to myself on open lanes and just go practice and entertain myself. Um, when I first started bowling, I threw a backup ball. Um and so I just, it started to evolve and I wanted to get better. I wanted to like learn how to hook it the right way is what I would say. Um, and so he just, he taught me all those basics and all those fundamentals. And um, I mean, if he hadn't brought that home, I don't know what I would do because I'm not really sound in any other sports, <laughs> but um, that's, that's where it all started. It started with him. Um, yeah. 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 That, that's cool that you have that family link to it because mm-hmm. I feel like when, you know, when family either leads you into it or at least Mm -hmm. supports you. I mean, you have such a leg up on others that are, you know, starting to get their feet under them in this. Yes, definitely. Um, How about uh, a junior program? What, uh, you know, what was it like out there? Um, And, you know, how'd you get into it? Yeah, I mean, I was very, I mean, I've been very fortunate throughout my career through juniors and and on up is uh, we had the Junior Bowlers Tour, which is JBT. Uh, out here. Uh, I started in season two and they're now in like season I don't know, 25, 26, 27. I don't know. I lost count. Okay. So um, I had that. And, and back then it was just in Arizona. It was like once a month, but it was something to bully and handicap and scratch. And I started when I was like 12. So like I did handicap. And then as I got older and got better, I went to the scratch division and learn to compete and it was it was boys and girls mix so it wasn't like a girls division when i bowled or a boys division um now it's separated um that they have like open girls scratch and all these other divisions but um so i got to compete with them and at first it was just house patterns and then as sport patterns became more um prevalent in the bowling industry towards the end of my jpt career before i went to college we bowled on sport patterns and really got to learn how to bowl on those we never saw graphs we just went out there and bowled and whatever was on the lane is what we bowled on so um you know jeff hemer runs that um organization and been a a huge impact on my career because he he allowed me to bowl something and it wasn't always just in one center it was around um arizona and then it started to just grow throughout the years um it's all over the place now on the west from like New Mexico all the way up into Washington. So uh, it's it's a fantastic program for the juniors. And um, without that, I, I mean, I would have had to figure out something else. But I still bowl junior leagues. But, I mean, that was a really big key thing for me as far as a junior career to to really get sharp and, and prepare to go to college if I wanted to compete at the collegiate level. Yeah. Was there any opportunity to bowl for a high school? Uh, not really. When I was in high school, um, high school bowling wasn't really a thing. Um, it's kind of a thing now here. I know it's a lot bigger. I would say more in like the Midwest and, and back East than it is, um, at least in Arizona. Um, so it really wasn't much high school bowling for me. I really didn't bowl anything as far as like team related until I went to college. Hmm. Um, so everything was always singles. It was always against the guys. Um, there weren't very many, um, female bowlers at my age because Shannon was, you know, four years older than me. So we, we had a pretty good gap. Like when she was a senior in college, I was a freshman. So huh. we had a good gap in our ages that uh, we, we did compete against each other as junior, but she was still so much older than me and I still had a lot of catching up to do. <laughs> so, um, But yeah, then she went to college and, you know, I really wanted to go to college too, just like her. Um, you know, I visited Nebraska, I visited central Missouri, um, and then ended up at central Missouri for, for college. So, yeah. yeah. 
uh bsj83 uh wants to know if you plan to bowl the lucy this year and if so who your partner is i am yes i am bowling the lucy and i am bowling with chris by again uh fellow us open winner so uh he's this is uh my fourth year bowling with him 21 22 yeah fourth year bowling and we finished our lowest finish has been ninth so um I think we have a really good team. So, uh, yeah, we'll be there. <laughs> cool. No, looking forward to seeing you out on the lanes in that great event. Um, you mentioned, you know, kind of going to central Missouri. And tell me about that process. I mean, was it a deal where you sought them out or did they recruit you? Um, it was kind of, I mean, back then things were so different. I mean, because like the colleges didn't come out to junior gold for recruiting. So you were kind of like sending like demo tapes out to colleges. Yeah. Like, like a, like a VHS tape. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys don't know what those are, you might have to Google VHS. I, um, I've got some spare ones I can send. Okay. You. <laughs> but yeah. Like, I mean, that's kind of how you had to do it because I graduated high school in 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, so like I was looking at like 2000, the summer of like Oh three, you know, it was when like I was really looking at colleges and I wasn't like I wanted to go to college, but I wasn't sure about college. I knew I wanted to bowl. <laughs> so um, I I sent out some tapes to um, I think it was Wichita, Central Missouri and Nebraska. Um, you know, those were the dominant ones at the time that I bowled. You know, Wichita was still uh, more on the USBC side. You know, I know now that they're going to be NCAA um, next year, but um, and then of course Central Missouri and Nebraska were the dominant teams as far as NCAA. And so I looked at both options, but when it came down to it, I really wanted to bowl NCAA. Um, I really wanted to be a student athlete as far as an NCAA organization. So it just came down to Nebraska and Central Missouri. And when um, it was all said and done, Central Missouri just felt like the right choice for me, and that's where I landed. Um, completely different uh, environment than being home. I will tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got a little little more change in season there. Uh, yeah, I yeah a lot of seasons, uh, a lot of weather that is very temperamental, um, cold and humid. But yeah, I, I made sure I went home on breaks. <laughs> yeah, I was in uh, in the collegiate game maybe about. I'm going to say maybe five years before you were uh, mid late nineties. And it always, it always felt like those directional schools in Missouri mm -hmm. always kind of found a way. They always yeah. found a way to be relevant. They always had a couple really good players. Yeah. That, did you, were you aware of the history there uh, of Not, you know, bowling? No, I literally knew nothing. Um, I knew because I had seen them both with the national title in 2003 and again in 2004, and I was like, well, they don't like a bad team. Let's like, let's look at it. And I, I, I was a late visitor. Like I didn't visit them until February of 04. So like, which was probably not the best time to visit them because it was so cold. Um, but it was during a time I had off for school, which Tucson is the only one that I think has this. We have rodeo break. Um, oh. so we get two days <laughs> off in, uh, February for the rodeo that I don't go to. Um, <laughs> but, um, that's where I went. And then I visited, I met, you know, coach Holmes and the girls that were there and I really, it just felt like home. And so that's where I ended up going, um, uh, in the fall. Yeah. What was your coach like? Um, you know, in my experience, smaller school, no mm -hmm. coaching, da 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 da. Yeah. So I'm always interested to hear about the coaches that you know that helped you kind of grow your game and how they did it. Yeah, you know, Ron Ron Holmes was my coach then. He still coaches there at Central Missouri. I'm still very close with him. Um, you know, he he took me on and. Um, I would say in college, I was not the most tactful person um, when it came to, I mean, I had to learn how to bowl on a team. I was, you know, a big fish in a little pond and I always bowled individually. So I had to learn to be a team player. Like I was a good player, but I was the first semester I was competing against my teammates because I was like, they can't beat me. You know, I just, I just didn't know how to bowl on a team. Um, and so 
I quickly had to learn how to bowl on a team and be a team player. And he helped me learn that and, you know, helped me fine tune, you know, spare games and, and just being aware of maybe lane patterns and what bowling balls do. So um, he's played a huge part in, in that throughout my college career. And, you know, it's now come full circle because he asked me for help now. And if I have any opinions or if I see things or how the game has been evolving because he's, I see it in a different environment than he does. Um, so it's good that we still have that relationship, you know, um, and it's, it's, he was a great coach for me. Um, you know, and I'm glad that I was able to, to be there for four years. I enjoyed my time there. Uh, we didn't win a national title, but I had a lot of success there and, um, you know, the program, you know, paid off for me and it, it helped me lead me into where I'm at now. Yeah. I mean, you're kind of underselling it when you say, oh, I had some success because you had what's possibly the greatest collegiate career of them all. First bowler <laughs> in NCAA history to be named NTCA Player of the Year four consecutive years, All-American all four years. I mean, for somebody who had to come in and kind of, you know, as you describe it, learn the team aspect of the <laughs> I mean, it, what worked out so well for? You? Yeah, I I don't know. It, it's funny, and like, I hear my my accomplishments, and I remember doing a podcast with um, Emil Williams for <clears throat> excuse me PWBA a few years ago, yeah. and he was like, "You were good in college," and I was like, "Yeah, I guess." And <laughs> I guess it just kind of came to mind because I was sitting next to my retired jersey that they had retired when I was still bowling. <laughs> <laughs> And it had like my little name plate of all like my accomplishments. And I was like looking at it and I was like, oh, yeah. But I mean, once I got past the, you know, stop bowling individually and bowl as a team, like I just wanted to bowl good for my team and I wanted to bowl good for us and I wanted us to win. I wanted us to win a national championship. Like it was just so built into my mind that I wanted to bowl good for all of us. So I think the success of, you know, all, all tournament teams that I got, all the MVPs that I got, the player of the years, the the all Americans was just because I was so goal driven on trying to do so well for the team um, that they just came secondary. I, I didn't really think about, I stopped looking at trying to be the MVP of the tournament. I stopped looking at trying to be the all American. They just kind of happened. Um, you know, I'm very fortunate. I will tell you, I had 26 all tournament teams. That's, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> now that I look at it, I'm like, Oh my gosh, that's a lot. But I, again, I, I didn't realize it until it was all said and done because I stopped being like the individual player. Um, but it did take a lot of time. And, um, in my best, my best friend to this day, um, Sarah, she'll probably tell you that I was the worst teammate in the world until I learned how to like be a teammate. Um, but <laughs> she was there for it. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. No, Connor Brown in the chat saying, hey, Feff and Brianna, one of my absolute favorites. I, I would think, you know, we're both your absolute favorite because between us, we have 26 all tournament teams <laughs> in collegiate bowling. Oh, that, that's a 13 tough each. Act. Just wouldn't know. That, that's a tough act to follow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> BSJ83 uh, asking who you think will be the top challengers for PWBA and the uh, player of the year in 2024. Maybe mm -hmm. right there. I mean, I, I put myself in contention, but uh, I am not one that is like a goal, like oriented or driven person. Like I don't say I have to, I have to finish here. I have to place here. I have to win an event. Like I just want to bowl and be consistent and stay present. Um, but every year it it's kind of different as far as like who's in the running for player of the year. Could it be the same people as last year? Could it be new players? Could it be up and comers? Like, I, I don't know. I, I still think you're going to have, you know, the veterans still, you know, putting names out there. You know, I'm hoping that, you know, I'm in contention. You can never count someone out like Danielle McEwen, Liz Johnson. You have the defending player of the year, the, the, which is Jordan Richard. I mean, what she did last year was absolutely amazing. She's one of my best friends and it was just an awe to watch it. Um, you could have someone like Diana Zadialova who came pretty close to trying to win player of the year, maybe trying to prove to something, you know, there's, then you have the up and coming collegiate players that maybe want to try to make a name for themselves. Some people have success right away out of college and just, 
shoot up into the spotlight and start winning everything. So I, I think it really, there's so many names. Like I can't just give you like a handful. I mean, there's, you know, I, I'm not going to not put my name in the hat though. Cause I've done it before. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I think what you're saying is, these people need to get their butts over to Egan and uh, and see it. For, yeah, I for mean, I, it, you got to come out and compete. And yeah. um, as long as you're out there and you're you're competing, and it really is, it can go to anybody. Mm -hmm. For sure. So you finish up college, as you mentioned, the tour was kind of in a hiatus. Mm -hmm. So what did you do? What did you bowl? Um, I bowled. Uh, I bowled a lot a, of like local things. So a lot of stuff with guys, um, you know, open state tournaments, open state tournaments, a few women's, you know, state queens, um, sometimes state masters if there wasn't enough for state queens. Um, I did bowl the USBC queens because those still kept going. I did bowl the US Open for the women because that still kept going. We still had those two majors. Um, I bowled some regionals around here um, just to kind of get my feet wet as far as like competing on that kind of a stage. Um, but I really wasn't scared to bowl anything. I just never bowled like any of the men's national stops. Um, I think I bowled the masters one time just for the heck of it. Cause my husband did. Um, but that was, you know, way before I think I had any clue what was going on. Uh, but yeah, so I, I, I bowl a lot of stuff. I do bowl against mostly men at home as opposed to women. So um, I think that helps me see the lanes a little bit differently. Um, helps me learn breakdown. I think that comes into play a lot when I bowl the Lucy um, with Chris, um, even though completely different um, styles, I am also still able to kind of keep up with those transitions because I bowl so much with the men here at home. Um, so that's, and I still compete with the men here. So it, that's, that part hasn't really changed. Now I just have the women's tour in the summer yeah. <laughs> and team USA on top of it. If I, if we have any events and I'm fortunate enough to travel, um, I bowl for them. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, that being the case, I asked Theo about whether complete bowling events are helpful, uh, you know, in your, uh, you know, bowling career. He said as a tournament director, he'd like to think that his tournaments have been helpful to build <laughs> towards some success. He says that he knows you work extremely hard on your game, and that's where the majority of the success is attributed to. But he says, I can't help but toot my own horn when he's seen so many of his players having success on the PWBA and PBA tours. So uh, what, what, what are your thoughts? <laughs> oh, Theo, honestly, like – his events are nothing but helpful. Honestly, um, he puts out a variety of patterns. Sometimes they're easy. Sometimes they're extremely hard, uh, but it keeps us tournament sharp and you can't really prep for tournament as far as like tournament sharpness. Like you need to go and compete. You can practice all you want on, on your game, your physical stuff, practice speed, practice, you know, accuracy and all those things. But when you're like in the middle of it and you're thrown into an event and you know, like a certain scoring pace, or you may need to make a shot to cash or make a shot to, to make the finals or something like you can't really mimic that. So bowling tournaments, um, because even if it's these local one day events, they keep you tournament sharp They're You're on your game because like those shots still matter. No, you're not bowling for a national tour title, but you're still competing for something. And I mean, I still want to win everything that I bowl, whether it's, you know, a local event or, or a major on TV. So they definitely help. And sometimes they go well, sometimes they don't go well. I've, I've bowled really well on the hard things in his events and I've not bowled well on the easy things sometimes. And that's just how bowling goes. But I, you know, I continue, if I'm here, I'm going to bowl them because again, like I said, they make you tournament sharp. Uh, and I think people need to get a couple events under their belt to mentally prepare them for competing. It's a different mindset when you're competing as opposed to when you're in on the lanes in practice um, preparing for events. So, um, yes, and he's had, you know, he has me bowling them. He has Cortez bowling them. He's had Jacob bowling them. He's had Darren Kang bowling them. Um, he Simo's come out. I mean, he, he's had some players that, 
people know come bowl his events, you know, and we have some, a couple pretty big events here in Arizona um, that draw some big, big names. So he should toot his own horn. (laughs) (laughs) For sure. So let's kind of uh, harken back to a time when you did have some success over there uh, because I asked Brooklyn Rob, Rob Purishad about you. (laughs) And uh, he said that his his first run-in with you was bowling you in the CBA or CBE final match on Red Square. Uh, He said you needed to uh, make a baby split to beat him. And he already had his stuff in his bag because he knew he lost. Yes. uh, And Red Square is my favorite pattern. I... Cause it's hard. It's hard for everybody. It's red square, but we all know it looks like a blue rectangle because it's so <laughs> flat. Uh, but when you look at a graph, so that's what I call it. I'm like, Oh, blue rectangle. Uh, but um, yes, you know, and I've bowled with Rob a few times. Uh, we get paired together on CBEs and stuff. Um, always a great guy to bowl against. But yeah, I remember um, he, I think he finished first and I think I needed a mark and I'm like, all right, let's throw a good shot. Well, obviously that didn't happen if you're 310. So <laughs> I'm like, nobody wants to shoot a 310. Like it, yeah. I'd rather shoot a 3610. But then again, now that I think about it, no, I wouldn't. But uh, <laughs> so I left the 310 and I actually aced it and I ended up winning. And I remember him, he had told Bill O'Neill at one point and I had ran into Bill O'Neill and he was like, yeah, Rob told me you aced that 310 and beat him. I was like, yeah. <laughs> Oh, that, but, that's cool. Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm with you on the three six ten, and and we'll we'll get to the three six ten in a bit. Yeah. Here. But uh, so 2015 comes, and the tour comes back. I mean, what kind of feeling is that to have had you know the success and the trajectory toward the tour, and, and then to be finally able to give it a shot? Yeah, I mean, when the tour relaunched in 2015, it was. Um... I think it was kind of shocking at first because it was a very small tour. It was happening after July 4th. It was only a few events. We weren't sure kind of what our entries were going to be like, what was going to happen, who was really going to be able to do it. Um, and so it it launched, and um, I think it kind of just took off because there were so many of us that didn't have that opportunity to, to compete at the professional level. And then you had those young ones that maybe had been a couple years removed from college or just getting out of college. And so it gave them opportunity and it was just super exciting. And um, it was exciting. It was overwhelming at the same time because I also got married in 2015. So I had the tour and then I was getting married and there was a lot going on. So I was preparing for a lot, but it was an awesome feeling. And um, I was very fortunate to make the tour championships of the very first year on tour. And I was the only player to make the tour championships who never made a TV show. So I thought that was pretty cool to do, which just showed consistency as far as if you don't have to make TV shows to kind of get to the year end events, as long as you're consistent and you just kind of push through. Um, So it was pretty cool to do that. And um, I think the tour from there just kind of kept getting better and better. And we just started growing and learning how to evolve um, the tour for the, you know, the women maybe who teach or have kids and kind of work around their schedules. So we could still have a professional tour uh, maybe not in length that some of us would love, but it's better. It, the way it works out is is we get more um, more draw from not only spectators, but as far as entrance as well because of the structure of the events. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up the scheduling part because I was going to ask, you have all this history on Team USA. You're still consistently making the team. I mean, is there any conflict between the tour and these times when – you're bowling for our country? Um, I mean, thankfully, no, um, they've done a really good job. You know, most of the team USA events happen, you know, in the fall. So, you know, we wrap up usually in August. Um, so there is events later this year. So it, it, it works out really well that they don't conflict. And that's kind of why we have team USA camp the week before just for the women. Um, it just works out for scheduling ways. We're going to have camp and then we're going to be on tour and then, Team USA stuff happens. So um, I think the men's camp is a little bit later in the year because the men are on tour right now. So they couldn't have a camp in the first part of the year. So, um, you know, the organizations really work to try their best to not overlap um, as best they can as far as, um, you know, the 
the Pan American region, which that we're in, they do really well at trying to make sure they don't overlap those things as far as when all of our trials are, other country trials are. And I think that's why it's best to have it more in the fall because the men are done usually about September um, and we're done in August. So you have, you know, three months towards the end of the year for us to compete. And that's kind of how it happened um, in, in 2022. Yeah. You, uh, you know, you're, like you said, you're off to a good start on tour. You're kind of gaining momentum. And then in 2021, you get your second title at the ITRC Classic. And when the dust settles, you're the player of the year. You've got just enough points, you know, to get Shannon O'Keefe out of there. Mm -hmm. With the benefit of hindsight, I mean, what did it take to have that incredible season that you had? 2021 was... um a long season we had 20 events um that's the longest season that we've had since the relaunch so 20 events i we were on tour all year essentially because we had the kickoff classic series in january the regular tour and then we wrapped up in october with another classic series in reno so we really bowled the entire year and i think um i've always been a bowler that's like a marathoner like i, I like a lot of games i like a lot of time i'm not a huge sprinter um, so I think being able to have 20 events and you're allowed to have maybe some whoopsies, you know, maybe not compete as really well. You're going to make mistakes, um, you know, but still have a really good success on the lanes. I still made a lot of TV shows and I still did well. So I think consistency overall is kind of what helped that season to to get to the player of the year. And it was it 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 was very unexpected. Um because it wasn't something that I had been eyeing at the end of that year. I just wanted to finish the year on a positive note and uh, to be in contention for player of the year with one event to go. Uh, it wasn't in my mind. I wasn't thinking about that. I was just trying to stay present on the tour championships, which was the last event that I had to bowl, you know, getting the number one seed and hopefully trying to win my first major because uh, winning a major was like the next goal that I wanted to do after winning regular titles. I'm like, I want to be a major champion. Um, and so, it, but bowling and life works out in mysterious ways and it had other plans. And I ended up being player of the year before I even stepped on the lanes to compete for that title. Um, Cause everything was so close and so tight. But again, that's, I think that's the beauty of also women's tour. If somebody asks who's in contention for player of the year, well, I can come down to the very last event and make it super exciting. It's it's a lot different than the men's tour because ours is just strictly points. It's mm -hmm. whoever has the most points on top, they're player of the year. Yeah. No questions asked. You know, you don't have to wait for anything. And um, it everyone's doing the calculations, trying to figure it out. And uh, it was a very exciting, um, exciting thing for it to happen the way it did. Very unexpected because I think if you try to push for that thing to happen again, it doesn't happen. You just kind of let those things happen. Yeah. Yeah, I always tell my son, knock down what's in front of you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you don't get all 10, knock down what's in front of you on the second shot. You're yeah. just going to do it over and over. Um, <laughs> and, and you did, and, and you met that goal a couple of years later at the at the U.S. Open this past year. Um, what went right during the course of that event? Because we, you know, we see the little, you know, the little subset at the end. Yeah. yeah. But we do, a lot of us don't, you know, see what led up to that. Yeah, you know, the U.S. Open, I, I love the U.S. Open because of the amount of games. Um, the the I started the U.S. Open actually with a cold, really sick, uh, the first squad. I looked at my ball rep and I was like, man, I, I don't feel good today. I, I feel like crap. And maybe that helped me striking and I bowled really good the first block, but I somehow got like a cold for like two days and it started to go away as, as the week went on. But I always know with the U.S. Open, it's going to be tough. Um, it's going to be about shot making. It's going to be about spares. Um, I try to make sure that I shoot all my spares in practice. I try not to reset things. I try to do my best I can to sh constantly be on top of my spare game because um, because you never know. But um, at the same time, it, things just started to fall in place. I had a clear picture of how things were going on each pattern. Um, you know, the hard flat pattern. I really just tried to execute fill frames, whether it was a strike or spare, like I didn't need to string them. Like you just can't have this mentality that you're going to, you know, throw eight barriers because that's not what the U S open is. It's just one shot at a time, fill your frame, get to, you know, the first cut and like, okay, we're in the cashers round. Okay. So we see another new pattern 
Try to figure this one out. Where how is it going to play? Okay, figure out the cash is round. Then we got twenty four more games of match play. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, all right, just take it one match at a time, one shot at a time. They're going to change. They're going to be different every single time. Um, I had games where they were really good, and and it happened across the board. You would see us shoot like two fifty, and then we'd go to the next one and shoot one seventy. But we might win the one seventy, but we might lose with the two thirty because there the lanes were just constantly changing. We were the transition was happening and when the transition happened, the lanes got really good. But when they happened again, you're kind of not sure what's happening and you get kind of lost and, you know, shot making goes away and you're, you're not leaving things you can make. Um, so it really, that's kind of how the week went. I mean, it wasn't just like all butterflies and rainbows where we're all shooting over 200 and just striking at will. No, I mean, I, I bowled qualifying with Clara and Birgit. And so, I could tell you that there were times where, you know, all three of us were like trying to figure things out, but you know, we, we needed what we need to get done in the end. And I bowled next to Diana Zavialova for all of match play. And we, same thing, you know, we had really good games. We had games where we were just grinding for 180 and um, trying to figure it out, just trying to get the win to get 30 pins and try to stay plus. So uh, you don't get to see that on TV. You really don't. Um, and then you get to the TV and, you know, the first couple of games are a couple are just kind of two O's and nothing great, you know? So it, it really, it was a long week, but the TV show doesn't really show you the, the big picture of, of the week that we had, <laughs> I should yeah. say. Yeah, for sure. I mean, with all those games, it just can't. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do want to kind of put in a plug for folks. If, uh, if you like what you're seeing here, please consider liking and subscribing to the channel. I'm trying to get to 2000 subscribers. I'm a little ways away right now, but hopefully with your help, uh, you know, clicking on that logo in the bottom right and uh, subscribing to the channel. Uh, it will certainly help me continue to make this content. The TV show, although not fully representative as, of the tournament as a whole, is what you have to succeed in to win the tournament. Mm -hmm. And it comes down to you and Clara. And it's a 150 to 140 grind fest. And, you know, you got it done, but you had to make that 3-6-10. What was going on uh, on the lanes, you know, when you got to that championship match? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I can see we're watching this thing like, what is going Like, did did we forget how to bowl? Because that's what it looks like. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, because the match against Danielle was fine. You know, I had like one Brooklyn shot where one got away from me, but... Otherwise, I had a pretty good handle on what was going on. I felt calm. I felt collected. Um, you know, I'd bowled on TV before, so it wasn't new. I'd started to figure out how to bowl on TV. You know, I, I went through this phase where I, I couldn't win on TV, and then I kind of figured out how to do that at the BBL in New York when I shot 800 on TV and not even knowing it. And I was like, okay, I, I think I figured out how to bowl on TV. And so that magic is in, you know, I just felt really confident and aware of like just make it shots you know you're bowling danielle she's one of my really good friends but she's danielle like she's not gonna back down so you, you can't back down right. um and so that was that mentality against her and then go into the championship round against clara same thing i mean clara again great player she you knows she's done so many things in the sport you know you can't count her out either and i i, I don't really know what came about me you know i missed the temp in the first frame and I'm like, okay, just like, let it go. Like you need to have short-term memory. You can't think about these things when you're bowling on TV because the games go by way too fast. And again, two more opens. I'm like, all right, we're doing great. We got three opens here. Well, what's going on? And I, that's when like panic set in and I, I try not to panic, but I'm human. And I went to my ball rep and I, Sean Ryan, and I'm just like, what am I doing? And freaking out. And he's just like, calm down breathe he's like you are just running through these shots and you need to calm down take a deep breath slow everything down you know and i'm very grateful that i had you know him and eric Krause and steve jacobs there to like just talk to you like they could have talked to honestly anything about they didn't even have to be about bowling they could have just talked something just to calm my mind down and settle my nerves and then figure out what to do out there because if i can't make good shots i can't even give them feedback on what the ball's doing or how to play the lanes so it was just getting myself collected well first so i could make a good shot and then i can go back and figure out to them 
okay, what do we need to adjust from there? You know, I was a little timid on the right lane. I was leaving two pins constantly, but then I felt like I couldn't miss on the left lane. I'm like, okay. Um, and then I leave a spare in the, in the eighth and I'm like, miss that one. I'm like, oh, my spare game's not doing so good today, but it's fine. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, I strike on the ninth and you know, I've, I'm like telling myself like, okay, come on. Like it's not over. Like you, you just have to keep pushing because Claire, I didn't know what Claire was going through. I, mm -hmm. I obviously knew by this, by how she was bowling she was, I don't know if it was nerves. I don't, she could have had something physically. I, I don't know. Like we're not conversing, you know, and our, our reps are really good at just like keeping us separate, which is, you know, great. And I don't know how they do it, but props to them. So I didn't know what was going on with Clara. I knew we just were struggling in our own ways. And so I, she's doing her own thing. And then I realized that I'm going to make a ball change in the 10th frame. Uh, and, <laughs> and cause I was like, okay, the, even though I didn't make the spare in the eighth frame, I felt like I threw a good shot and I felt like I did exactly what I needed to do. And Sean was like, it, it's just not it. Like you can't throw that ball anymore. Like you cannot. And I said, you're telling me that I have to make a ball change in the 10th frame <laughs> for the U S open title. Like those, those were my words to him. And he goes, yep, throw the reality check. And I said, okay. <laughs> like, but I think at that, like at that moment, like I have so much trust in him and, and the rest of my reps. And I also know, like, like sometimes you just got to make a decision. You have to just be like ballsy in a sense and it's going to work out or it's not. Um, had I thrown it a little bit firmer and not so timid I, I think it would have struck i really do it was the right call it was the right ball to throw um a lot of people don't make those risks and i've i've learned to be more risky in my bowling um take the big chances sometimes they pay off sometimes they don't but until you make those choices um you'll never trust yourself to do it um and then i suck at bowling math so i had no idea how many pins i needed <laughs> <laughs> and my best friend was there. She had flown in to watch me because uh, my husband couldn't make it. So my best friend, my best friend's husband told her she was coming for the show. And so she knew because she's genius. I call her Google how many I needed. And she's like, why didn't you look at me? And I'm like, I can only focus on my ball rips. Yeah. And Sean's like waving one. And I'm like, huh? And I'm like, whatever. And like, I didn't try to like, chop the I didn't try I just hit the three pin I just mm -hmm. that spare had my number all week I had a lot of people's number that week because mm -hmm. the lanes were hooking in such a weird spot sometimes that the three six ten just became very choppable and um so when I threw it and I got two I was like okay I think that's enough I don't know <laughs> and then they all fell and I knew when they all fell that I had one yeah. um but it wasn't until the third one fell that I I had actually known I won because I, because I, I'm not really good at bowling math, <laughs> um, but it was, um, yeah, it was nerve wracking. I mean, I was nervous. I'm not going to lie. I was nervous. I'd never been in that situation yet. I bowled for queen title before I bowled for the tour championship okay. title before, but I think because the U S open is so pre prestigious to me and it's my favorite event. Um, I wanted it so bad. Um, hopefully this next time it's better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, and I love that Sean was the one who said, you got to make the change because at that point, you know what, if things go sideways, you've got a scapegoat, right? He, yeah. He's the guy. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't call him the scapegoat, but yeah. uh, no, I mean, uh, he was um, essential in, in that game um, in that moment um, because I think without that, that bluntness and that sternness, you know, I would, I would have been second guessing it, but when it's like, no, like you are, what you're thinking is correct. Like you threw a good shot. This ball's not doing what you got to do. We have to make a choice and we have to make it now. We don't have time to wait. Like that's the kind of things like you need in your corner to help you be successful. Um, and it's almost like a ride or die. Like I'm going to ride with you or I'm going to die with you. And right. 
um, to have that in your corner is is essential um, on tour or just in life. Yeah, essentially. Yeah, you need somebody to say what they're thinking unapologetically, kind of like what you have in your storm bio about yourself. <laughs> yes, is that, exactly. Is, is that a help for your bowling or a hindrance? Um, it depends on the day, honestly. You know, I've always been a very, I'm a very outgoing, blunt person. Um, and I think um, having somebody who is also like that um, helps pushes your buttons, but also you respect it because you know you're that same way and you would, they would want that same treatment um, if the roles were reversed. Um, so yeah, I'm very, uh, like I said earlier, if, if some of my teammates didn't want my opinion and they were struggling, they were going to get it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And probably for the better in most cases. So. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. only here to help. And I, yeah. I know Sean, he was, he's never going to tell me something to, you know, hurt me. Um, mm -hmm. And again, it's that, he was like, yep, rally check. And he literally turned away and didn't say a word. And I was like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm not even going to argue with you. And I, I rewatched the show um, and heard Kelly um, Kulik and I was like, she's ball changing. <laughs> and I think in her mind, um, because I mean, Kelly's a bowler, you know, I, it, it, it does take a lot of guts and um to do that but at that moment like i really didn't think about it like i didn't think about like i had spelled it out like i had said i'm ball changing 10th frame for the us open title but i didn't process it until after the fact that man that could have been really bad <laughs> sure but it wasn't yeah. it was really but it good wasn't. <laughs> and in the end there you go. I, I you know. Were, I have the, the trophy and the spear ball did its job. <laughs> yeah. So so where's the where's the jacket now? Do you ever wear the jacket? I have my husband had the jacket framed for me. Uh, yeah, which um I, I'm glad it's framed and it's like off to this, it's on the wall and my trophy's kind of next to it. So um yeah, there it's um, you know, one of my favorite trophies, honestly. Um very proud accomplishment that I've done. So, uh, yeah, it, the jacket is not going to be worn. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, to have the success that you've had and to always be kind of in the hunt, you're always knocking at the door. You're always relevant. Um, you know, this is another thing. I think what, you know, what is it that makes that happen? And he says the amount that, you know, you've bowled, uh, of talent that you bowled against in Arizona growing up and everywhere else. It's no shock that you're always in the hunt. Um, mm -hmm. He says that you've bowled against some of the best your whole life. Those moments mixed in with the natural talent perfected by all the work you put in. That's why you're always in the hunt. And a lot of people will say, I put in the work. I put mm -hmm. in the work. I'm sure you, you say the same. What does that mean for you? What is putting in the work in your eyes? I mean, I think putting in the work um, is just accumulation of, of everything that I've done from the time I started bowling through my junior program, through college, through prior to the tour, through even the tour itself. I mean, the tour makes you evolve as a bowler as well. Uh, so I think as far as fine tuning myself, like how I bowl, like not trying to conform to something else, like I bowl how I bowl. So I'm just going to master my craft on how I do it, try to tweak some things, maybe learn speed adjustments, maybe learn to do different things with my hands and have just a bag of tools within my craft. But I feel like my biggest, um, I think, asset over the last four years is mental it's a lot of it is mental. And I think I've looked at bowling in a little bit of a different way as far as like, yeah, I'm going to have good days. I'm going to have bad days. Uh, but I can't let some of the bad things really dictate that time or present or, like, or the future. Like I really need to stay present everything that I do. Uh, and like I've said before, you really have to have short term memory. You you can't dwell on it like it's gone. Like like I may have flagged a 10 pin, but like whatever. I have like 80 more frames to bowl. I, I can't think about that. I can't be mad about that. I have to try to figure out, you know, the next frame, the next shot. 
And so I think having a really strong mental game of just staying present, um, yeah, you're going to get frustrated. You're going to have emotions, but how you control them, I think, is what really shows how you perform on the lanes. Um, don't make things happen. Let them happen. Just just bowl. You know, like my husband tells me all the time, like, just bowl. Like, don't think about anything. Just bowl and just let kind of everything, your, your physical game just kind of falls into place. So I would contribute most of my success, honestly, to my mental game. Um, and, and it mostly just came of like, like no matter what happens, everything's going to be okay. No matter if I win, no matter if I finish last, everything's going to be okay. Um, and that kind of hit home when like my husband told me that, like after I had like a really bad day a few years ago, um, I think it was sometime, actually, I think it was in 2021 sometime where he was like, you know, like you don't have to prove anything. Like we don't love you less if you bowl bad. You know what I mean? Like it, like at the end of the day, you're going to come home. It's going to be okay. And I'm like, and like, I just kind of hit a switch in my brain. Like you're right. Like I, I just need to go and bowl and do what I love. And as long as I'm doing that and I'm consistent at it, like everything else is going to fall into place. Um, so I've kind of had that mentality over the last few years. And then the last two years, I've had a lot of loss in my life as far as like family and best friends. So I think that also opened up my eyes to, um, you know, anything can happen at a moment's notice. And just because I have a bad game, like it, it doesn't ruin my life. It doesn't ruin this, this day. Um, there are worse things that could happen. And so I, I just kind of look at it as, as I'm doing what I love and I'm going to do the best I can today. My best today may be better than tomorrow, but it's going to be my best for at that time. Yeah. And the totality of your career is already being recognized. You mentioned your numbers retired at Central Missouri. You're part of their Athletics Hall of Fame. Uh, recently, you got into your Association Hall of Fame. I know what that's like for all of us. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. What's it like for you? Uh, I mean, it's pretty amazing, uh, you know, to to have my jersey, told my jersey was retired while I was still competing was kind of crazy. Um, and then to get inducted into the Athletic Hall of Fame at Central Missouri. Um, I went in as a, as a team first, and then I went in as a player individually. Uh, so it was pretty cool to be recognized. Um, especially for bowling, because a lot of people don't think about bowling as like an athletic thing, you know, as a big athletics as far as, as collegiate, but um, it was just very, Although they should, they should, <laughs> they should, but you know, it just kind of was like, Oh, like it made me appreciate, you know, it's like being recognized. I just, I, I was grateful for it. And then um, this, this year I was inducted into the, the Tucson hall of fame. And it, this was the first year I was actually eligible to be elected based off the requirements. Um, somebody nominated me and I was inducted immediately um, by, or voted in immediately by the, the committee. And um, I was kind of in shock, honestly, by it because I was like, am I old enough to, to be in the Association Hall of Fame? Like, I wasn't sure. Um, like, I just didn't think about it. Like, I didn't think I should be in yet. I, I don't know, I feel like I still need to do more things, um, but I was very grateful and honored uh, that they, allowed me in the first year I was eligible. And um, so, yeah, I hope maybe one day there'll, there'll be more Hall of Fames in my future. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, uh, you know, I've kind of alluded to it a couple times, you have too, that uh, along with, you know, all the things you do, competitively speaking in bowling, you're also in the industry. Apparel EFX uh, is the company online, it's EFX CO. How did that all start for you and your husband? And what has it turned into now? Yeah, I mean, I'll be 100% honest with you. This is my husband's baby, his bread and butter. Um, you know, in 2014, he was like, I think I'm going to learn how to, to design things. And um, he taught himself how to design jerseys and design images. And um, then it kind of just started taking off that he was going to make bowling jerseys. And in 2015, when the tour relaunched, he was like, well, you're obviously going to wear our jerseys. So we got product registered with the PWBA. And so we've been, you know, this year marks 10 years that 
you know, EFX has been around that he's, he's done. And it's, like I said, it's his, it's his baby. Um, I'm very proud of him for what he's done. And, you know, we don't just do bowling. We do other sports as well. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's trying to be like a sportswear as opposed to like a bowling jersey company. You know, we have all these other different things that you can get. And it just, he just had an idea one day and, and uh, went with it. And he's just been evolving ever since and teaching himself to be a businessman and always trying to, to find a new venture in this business. Um, bowling is our backbone. And I think that's because of, of our background, honestly, being bowlers. But, um, you know, it's, he has his dreams for it to be, to be big one day. And then there's no doubt in my mind that he'll, he'll do that. And uh, like I said, we've been around for 10 years and now we are able to be on the PBA tour. So, um, you know, trying to, to get integrated into other sports um, with other athletes and influencers and to just be like a sports where it's, it's definitely growing and taking off. And uh, I just kind of sit there and awe and watch him. Um, yeah. I'm just here mostly for moral support and administrative <laughs> duties <laughs> um, with my background and my dad's company that I actually work full time for. So um, I, but again, it's just um, very proud for what he's done and um, he makes my jerseys look good. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and we could see that firsthand at the, uh, at the OCs, you know, but you got to have, you know, like you said, you got to have new ideas. You got to keep, mm -hmm. you know, evolving with the times. Yeah. You know, here's my branding idea for you. How's, how do you like that? Ah, oh, that's smart. Look at you. I see what you did there. I see what you did there. That's smart. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a, I'm a marketer nine to five, so you know, yeah, I kind of I mean, hey. can't get away from that. No. But uh, no. Uh, so, how long do you keep doing this? I mean, I know it's kind of a you know question, but mm -hmm. you know, you're successful on tour right now. You obviously like what you do; otherwise, you wouldn't be so excited about the new season coming up. I mean, is there, is there any end in sight? Not that I can see. Um, you know, I love competing. I, I love to bowl. I, I love being part of the industry. Um, you know, I've done coaching clinics. I've done things with junior gold. So not only do I love competing, but I also love being able to get back and, and to do things in, in the industry. Um, so, I don't see me stopping anytime soon. Um, I've had my fair share of injuries um, as I'm aging. So until my body tells me I can't uh, do it, um, you know, I think I'm going to do it as long as I possibly can. I'm definitely still going to be involved in the bowling community and in the bowling industry for as long as, as long as I can. So whether it's on the lanes or off the lanes, um, I don't intend on stopping anytime soon. <laughs> That's great to hear because this sport is definitely better with you in it. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, you know, let's go off the sheet. If, uh, you haven't seen the show before, this is where I ask you to challenge somebody else. It doesn't have to be the greatest bowler in the world, but certainly can be, uh, mm -hmm. to appear on a future show. Uh, so we interview them all high average, low average, medium average, mm -hmm. right-hander, left-hander, yeah. two-hander, yeah. women, yeah. men, all yeah. colors, races, and creeds. Yeah. Uh, Brianna Cote, yeah. who would you like to see on a future episode of Bowling with the Feth? Who I would like to see is um, the better Russo, Lauren Russo. Okay. <laughs> and I always <laughs> say better Russo because somebody in the audience put Lauren Russo as a better bowler on oh, the TV on show. The side. I, yeah. I think it was her player's mom, but I challenge yeah. Lauren Russo because I think you'll have a great time with her. Um, she's a great, she's a great person. She's a great bowler. Um, this is going to be her, I think her second full year on tour. And if it's anything like last year, I think um, you're going to see her do some amazing things this year. Yeah. She has actually appeared on the show one other time before, but I love bringing people back when they've added to their story with mm -hmm. something, you know, kind of that has some teeth. And she cer certainly has through mm -hmm. her coaching exploits yes. and then, you know, getting married and all that good stuff. So I would love to have her on. Plus, I always love the opportunity to um, uh, hit up Sean Walkner, who is the former UW Whitewater coach, about his eight <laughs> rankings, eight depth chart. Oh, he's got, okay. He's got rankings for each of the pates. So uh, that would be another <laughs> opportunity to, to bring that up. So, Lauren, if you see this, um, hopefully by now you know where to get a hold of me. If you don't, you know, 
Brianna. Hopefully you can nudge her in the right direction. Oh yeah. I'll let her know. We can bring her back <laughs> on the show. That would be awesome. Um, we are coming back on next week, uh, back at our usual time, 7 p.m. Uh, we have another star on the PWBA tour. I'm wondering uh, if you have crossed paths, have any anything to preview this with, but we're bringing on Elise Bolton, who uh, is a Nebraska alum. She's got the the YouTube channel, uh, some coaching in her history. Um, what is there anything that you can tell us that we might need to know about Elise before she comes on? Um, I've actually only crossed with Elise once on tour. Um, okay. I think uh, I think we were in Ohio last year, um, but I mean we had a good time. We both well, um, but yeah, I know she's got um, you know a YouTube channel, um, a lot of social media influence. So I know she's pretty pretty big in that. I think she's um, kind of like a free agent now, trying to different bowling balls and, and giving feedback on that. So I think that would be something interesting to hear her talk about. Um, but yeah, I, I haven't had too much interaction with Elise. Like I said, I've only kind of crossed with her once, but um, it wasn't anything horrible. It was a good experience. So I think it'll be a, a good show and I think you'll get some um, some good information from her. Yeah, as uh, we continue to preview the PWBA Go Bowling Twin Cities Open, she'll be on uh, next Wednesday, 7 p.m., April 24th. Looking forward to that. Brianna, thank you so much for spending all this time with us. I know That's we okay. went a little little over okay. the hour, but you had a lot of great stuff to tell, and we thank always you. appreciate the insight. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm glad we could finally pinpoint a time with the time difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it worked out well. Uh, and, uh, you know, like I said, you know, happy to do this, you know, adjust yeah. time for guests because – the stories are great, and uh, it's certainly worth it, you know, at least for me. I hope it's worth it for you, too. But yes. uh, but thanks again, and thanks to all of you who watched. Uh, always appreciate that. Be just and fear not, and we will see you again next week. Back up.